What is going on, geeks? Noah Jai from the Geek Week here, and we are back with another review. Boy, do we have an absolute gem to cover today as we'll be diving into the anime Pluto. Pluto is based on the manga of the same name that's written and illustrated by Naoki Urasawa. Not only that, the story is a retelling of the great Osama Tezuka's legendary manga, Astro Boy. Now, this isn't the first time I've spoken about Osama Tezuka on the channel, but to those that are unaware, along with being one of the most influential mangaka to ever live, Tezuka is also like the literal godfather of anime, bringing us classics like Blackjack, Kimba the White Lion, Phoenix, and of course our focus for today's review, Astro Boy. Now I should probably point out that Pluto is specifically a retelling of the story arc in Astro Boy titled The Greatest Robot on Earth, and named after the villain of the story arc, Pluto. Pluto, unlike Astro Boy, is told from the perspective of Gazikt, another of the seven great robots of the world. Though in the original adaptation, the character is much more simple going by Gerhardt. He is in fact still a detective robot, making him the perfect cast for the central character in the murder mystery that Pluto became. In the 1980s adaptation anime, he was named Zeron, named after the Zeronium he's constructed out of, but honestly, he only really made a brief cameo in that adaptation. <laughs> this is the end for you, Bruton. Relapse. Ooh, yeah. That looks painful. Speaking of the 1980s adaptation, it may not be a bad idea to go over that version first. It's not very long, and seeing as it's pretty close translation of the manga, I'm sure knowing it will make going over Pluto that much easier. Just bear with me, I promise. I'll make this quick. As the greatest robot on Earth begins, we learn a sultan has a robot built, a robot named Bruton, with the purpose of being, yeah, yeah, you guessed it, the greatest robot on Earth. To achieve this great task, the sultan orders Bruton, who from this point forward, we'll just refer to as Pluto to avoid confusion. To achieve this great task, the sultan orders Pluto to find and destroy the seven great robots of the world and prove its superiority. The first robot on the list is a mountain guide named Mont Blanc, who is located in Switzerland. Now Mont Blanc is pretty much kept the same in the 1980s adaptation and in Pluto. In both adaptations, Mont Blanc is depicted as a peaceful, loving robot, and sadly, he's Pluto's first target in both. Oh, and did I mention he has over 100,000 horsepower? Sorry, that is 135,000 horsepower. Uh. 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 Next on the list was North Number 2, a robot butler who, like Mont Blanc, is portrayed similarly in both adaptations. Pluto locates North Number 2 in Scotland and eliminates it. In an attempt to sway Astro Boy to fight him, Pluto kidnaps Astro's sister, Euron. Pluto's plan all but works as Astro agrees to fight Pluto in exchange for his sister, Euron, when suddenly, Brando, another of the seven great robots of the world, appears. Brando demands Pluto to fight him so he can avenge Mont Blanc. Pluto agrees, but returns Euron first as not to hurt her in the crossfire. Pluto and Brando do battle, with Pluto emerging as the victor, though badly wounded. As he lay nearly broken on the beach, Pluto asks Astro Boy to push a button on him that'll call his master so he can be repaired, and they can fight to the death. Although Astro makes it clear he doesn't want to fight Pluto, or any robot for that matter, he pushes the button so Pluto can be saved. This altercation leaves the Sultan furious with Dr. Abdullah, the man who created Pluto. Seeing as Pluto was almost defeated, the Sultan has Dr. Abdullah modify Pluto so that if he loses another fight, a detonation will occur, causing Pluto to explode, taking his opponent with him. The next robot to enter the story, like previously mentioned, is the centerpiece for the second adaptation we'll be going over. And that, of course, is Gerhardt. Or, to avoid confusion, let's just stick to Gesicht. The German robot inspector arrives on the scene to arrest Pluto. Sadly, Gazikt isn't the focal point of this adaptation, and, uh, things didn't quite go as smoothly. In Greece, the final two remaining great robots meet before their confrontation with Pluto. The first of the pair to face Pluto is Hercules, a warrior robot from Greece. This character is expanded upon much more in the Pluto adaptation, but nevertheless, Hercules is defeated by Pluto all the same. The final robot is Fotar, but keeping up with the trend of simplicity, let's just refer to him as Epsilon. Epsilon is kept very much the same in both adaptations as well, 
In this one, however, after witnessing the death of Hercules, Pluto demands Epsilon fight him. Epsilon agrees on the condition they do it in his home country so he can first say goodbye to his adopted children. He later perishes in his battle with Pluto. This story, much unlike the Pluto adaptation, focuses on the internal conflict within Astro Boy as he feels having one million horsepower is the answer to stopping Pluto, and the moral of the story being power is secondary when it comes to what makes people great. In this adaptation, Pluto, though brought to the side of good through reason, is easily defeated. By whom, you might ask? By Bora, a giant robot made by someone named Dr. Goji. With Pluto so easily defeated, and Astro Boy so clearly outmatched, Astro Boy is forced to use his smarts to take down Bora. Now, to make a long story short, Dr. Goji was actually Dr. Abdullah, and he made Bora to teach the arrogant Sultan a lesson by destroying Pluto in front of him. Oh, and uh, Goji was a robot himself, which may or may not play a factor later. All in all, it's a fantastic adaptation, and I definitely recommend it to you guys if you haven't seen it yet. Alright, now that we got that out the way, let's get into what we all came for. Let's dive in to Pluto. <laughs> Now, as I stated previously, Pluto follows another of the seven great robots of the world, that being the Europol robot detective Gizikt. Gizikt, like most of the other great robots, participated in the 39th Central Asian War, killing many robots like himself. This story is a direct aftermath of that very war, when it is alleged that the King of Persia has employed a robot scientist named Goji to build robots of mass destruction. The Bora survey inquiry was formed by the UN, comprised of scientific leaders like Professor Ochanamizu, the creator of Adam's sister Iran, and Professor Hoffman, the creator of Zeronium and Gazikt. Their mission was simple, to find these war robots that they suspected were in Persia. When all they discovered were a cellar full of dismantled robots, they report this to the UN. However, Persia is raided regardless, due to the government of Thracia insisting that Persia is a threat. Persia launches a robotic defense, but they are easily defeated, and their king, Darius XIV, is tried for war crimes. Sorry to go off on a tangent, but this will come up again, I promise. Now, as Pluto begins, we see Gizikt is following a string of mysterious murders, all of which where the culprit left an ominous calling card a pair of horns placed next to the victim's heads. Given the nature of the crimes, the most recent being the murder of Mont Blanc, a peaceful but powerful mountain guide robot, it's beginning to look more and more like a robot is responsible. The only problem with that theory is that some of the victims have been human, and in this society, all robots are programmed by law not to kill humans. But as Kazikt and us viewers would soon find out, there have been a few exceptions that have occurred. One such exception was the robot Brow 1589, a robot who prior to the events of this story broke that law and killed a human. Brow 1589 is now imprisoned in an artificial intelligence correctional facility where Gazikt visits him from time to time to help create a profile on the killer he is trying to track down. I absolutely loved these scenes with them. It was very Silence of the Lambs-esque with Brow 1589 playing the part of Hannibal Lecter. Just brilliant, truly, truly brilliant. The first of the great robots apart from Gazik that we see on screen is North Number 2. Just like in the previous adaptation, North Number 2 is a Scottish robot butler, but in Pluto, the character is much more layered. Much more layered. A reoccurring trend with the great robots that served in the 39th Central Asian War is trauma and guilt for killing so many of their own kind. North Number 2 is no different, and longs to be more than just a weapon. The relationship between North Number 2 and the man he served, Sir Duncan, was complex and beautiful, as they clashed over North Number 2's desire to learn music and Sir Duncan's refusal to accept technology can appreciate the art. When we learn Sir Duncan became bitter because he thought he was abandoned as a child, it is North Number 2 that uncovers the truth he could not see due to his blindness. In an incredibly short time, the relationship between these two characters feels so impactful, an absolutely wonderful display of character writing, truly, truly. Unfortunately, it is short-lived, because just as soon as the bond between the two of them grew, Pluto arrives. North Number 2 goes to confront Pluto and is destroyed. Two of the seven robots were now eliminated. While following leads on the case, Gazik begins having flashbacks of a significant moment in his life that he can't remember. The flashback is of someone selling him a robot for 50 Zeus. But oddly, Gazik has no recollection of this whatsoever. Outside of that, another link to the killings has become apparent. 
all of the victims happen to either be involved in the Bora survey inquiry or the 39th Central Asian War. With this knowledge, Gazik meets with another of the great robots of the world, fearing they may be the next on the killer's list. And that robot is, of course, Astro- I, I mean, I mean Adam. Adam. Adam served as a peace ambassador for the 39th Central Asian War, making him a prime target. During the conclusion of their meeting, Adam scans and copies Gazik's memory data so he can help with the investigation. Though, upon seeing Gazik's memories, Adam begins to cry. No doubt these are the memories that Gazik cannot recall. After learning all of Gazik's findings, Adam goes to warn Professor Ochanamizu that he too may be in danger seeing as he served on the Bora survey group. Gazik would go on to warn Brando, a Turkish robot Pankration wrestler, and another of the great robots of the world. Much like North Number 2, Brando's character is much more layered in this adaptation, as we see how much he cares for his robot wife and their adopted human children. Gazik tells Brando that he's likely a target for the killer due to his participation in the war. Brando thanks him, and they part ways. Not long after, Gazik visits Hercules, a Greek robot Pankration wrestler who served in the war. In this adaptation, Brando and Hercules are not only friends, but rivals in Pankration wrestling, which is essentially robots in Gundam suits battling to the death. It's honestly pretty epic. Shortly after, Pluto locates Brando, and the two robots fight to the death. Of course, Pluto would emerge victorious, but right back to the character writing in a sad scene, the last thing Brando sees before he dies is his wife and their children, as his processing unit begins to malfunction. Absolutely touching scene. At first, it appears almost as if Brando was successful in taking down Pluto, but for hours of searching, it is only Brando's dismantled parts that Hercules finds scattered amongst the rubble. Hercules comes across Brando's memory chip that is placed by his arms, and his arms are propped up in the position of horns. It's at this point that we are first introduced to Euron, Adam's younger sister. Euron was created by Professor Ochanamizu, and she has the ability to sense human, animal, and robot emotions. When Euron finds a sick and scared robot at the park, she begins to nurse it back to health. The two bond over painting flowers, and everything seems to be on the up and up. Well, I mean, that is until later it's revealed that robot was Pluto, or, well, sort of, Sahad, kind of. Moving on. Around the same time, we meet a man named Adolf Haas, a German traitor whose brother is killed by police. He believes to be Gazikt. Adolf is an active member of an anti-robot hate group, and he wants to get revenge for his brother's death. Meanwhile, Gazikt, who's looking to take a break from all the madness that's been going on, is planning a vacation with his wife to take his mind off of things. Oddly enough, when the two go to book tickets for this trip, they find out they booked the same exact vacation two years prior, but they have no recollection of it whatsoever. Now at this point, Gazik begins to suspect that he and his wife's memories have been deleted and replaced by fakes. Soon after, we are introduced to the final great robot of the world, Epsilon, an Australian photon-powered pacifist robot, just like in the previous adaptation. Also just like in the previous adaptation, Epsilon runs an orphanage. But much unlike his great robot counterparts, Epsilon did not participate in the 39th Central Asian War. Adam, much like in the original, doesn't actually want to fight with Pluto. Professor Chanamizu is visited by Dr. Goji, the man rumored to be responsible for the robots of mass destruction in Persia. He demands that the professor summons Adam so Pluto can fight him. Luckily, Adam is able to sense the professor is in danger when they speak on the phone and sends the police to rescue him. At that point, Pluto begins to look for Adam, but unfortunately, he finds his sister Euron instead. As Pluto goes to kill Euron, Adam saves her and takes on the robot. Unfortunately, yet again, Pluto is victorious as Adam is defeated and he is destroyed. Now, you guys remember Adolf, the man whose brother was killed by a police robot he suspects is Gazikt? Well, he decided to take matters into his own hands and tried to eliminate Gazikt himself, despite the anti-robot group telling him not to. They'd rather public opinion be what took down robots in society and not violence on their part. For going against the wishes of the anti-robot group, Adolf becomes their target, as they attempt to kill him several times. Then, in a twist of irony, Adolf is put under the protective custody of none other than Gazikt. Whilst in a heated conversation, Adolf insists that Gazikt interrogate him so he can prove that him being there is unnecessary. This backfires, of course, when Adolf unwittingly shows Gazikt crucial evidence in the form of a video, a video of Darius XIV speaking a list of names, 
names of the individuals involved in the Bora fact-finding mission. Now, if you haven't put one and two together, allow me to intervene. The memory that was taken from Gazikt was that of him killing Adolf's brother, and now it's all starting to come back to Gazikt. On top of that, it wasn't just the memory of killing Adolf's brother that was taken from him. There was also the memory of him and his wife adopting a robot child that Gazikt found on a mission after they had both longed to start a family. But why would the government erase that? Well, unfortunately, Adolf's brother had destroyed a robot, and that robot was Gazik's adopted son, setting him over the edge and causing him to push past his limits and kill Adolf's brother. Okay, okay, I glossed over this, but it is worth mentioning. Adolf and his brother have a long-standing history and hatred for robots, rooting back to their childhood, and they blame robots for their father's death. Not that that justifies it, I just wanted to point that out, you know, kind of important. Meanwhile, Pluto's next target is Hercules, as the two meet and fight, with Pluto killing Hercules in the process. Oh, and did you guys really think that was the end of Astro- I, I mean Adam? Of course not. Professor Ochanamizu then calls Professor Tenma, his predecessor, to bring Adam back to life. Now Tenma wasn't in the previous adaptation we spoke about as much, but we can talk about him now. Along with being the creator of Adam, he is also the father of the boy who became Adam, Tobio Tenma. When his son Tobio was lost to a traffic accident, he vowed to recreate his son as a robot, though he currently views them as two separate people. At any rate, Tenma answers Ochinomizu's call, and arrives to help Adam. Gazikt is getting closer and closer to catching Pluto, as he first visits the imprisoned King Darius XIV and interrogates him on the video he saw from Adolf. Darius confirms he ordered the death of the people who participated in the Bora survey group, as he blames their false findings on the downfall of Persia. And, to be honest, he wouldn't be wrong, though specifically, out of the countries in the UN that banded the Bora survey group, it was the United States of Thracia who pushed for the war in Persia. And honestly, we haven't talked enough about Thracia, who is seemingly at the root of all of this conflict. We often see their president Alexander being advised by their evil scientist supercomputer named Dr. Roosevelt. Oh, and, uh, Dr. Roosevelt appears as a super cute teddy bear. Yeah. Gazik then interrogates Professor Abdullah, the head of the Persian Ministry of Science, a man who lost most of his body and his family in the 39th Central Asian War. Gazik questions the professor about a photo, and Abdullah denies knowing the man in the picture. The picture is of a boy standing in a flower field, and Abdullah most certainly knows him. The picture is of Sahad, a robot created by Professor Abdullah and treated as his son after the death of his family. Through a conversation with Brow1589, Gazikt is able to figure out where to look for Pluto, now believing he understands what is happening. When Gazikt comes face to face with Pluto, we learn the sad truth of what has taken place. Sahad is Pluto. Now to be clear, Professor Abdullah had been emotionally blackmailing Sahad into acting out his revenge. To do this, Professor Abdullah transferred Sahad's AI into the Pluto robot, a robot capable of exacting this revenge for his family. As Gazik talks to Pluto, he's able to break through to Sahad momentarily, and the two do not fight. At the same time this is happening, Professor Hoffman, Gazik's creator, is kidnapped by Abdullah's robots. Gazik does not know that Hoffman is kidnapped, as the government neglected to tell him this. Either way, the conflict does not result in violence, and Gazik leaves Pluto alive, despite the wishes of the government. Sadly, not long after, Gazik is caught off guard by a small robot he met earlier when going to interrogate Professor Abdullah. Only this time, the small robot that reminds Gazik of the robot child he and his wife Helena adopted was equipped with a cluster cannon, as he shoots Gazik dead. In Gazik's final moments, he comes to the realization that nothing can be born from hatred. His wife Helena would later take the memory chip from her deceased husband to none other than Professor Tenma, as it would prove vital in finding who was responsible for killing him. Little did she know, it would prove vital in reviving Adam. Now, to be fair, it was actually revealed to us through one of Gazik's conversations with Brow1589 that a robot can be awoken through experiencing extreme emotion. Tenma, now in possession of Gazik's memory chip, uses it as a volatile emotion to install emotional upheaval data in Adam to cut through the state of infinite possibility that his data is in. And this revives Adam. All the while, Pluto continues his conquest and targets Epsilon. Epsilon dies in almost the same exact manner he did in the previous adaptation, also in both adaptations. 
Pluto asks Epsilon to kill him and put an end to his conquest, showing the internal struggle in Zahad. And at that moment, Bora interferes, blocking out the sun with his shadowy form, and Pluto kills Epsilon. Now, who is Bora? Yes, yes, I know, it's confusing. But this Bora was named in spite of the survey group. Bora is a massive robot with world-ending power. We learn initially Darius XIV ordered Abdullah to create a robot strong enough to terraform the Earth to vitalize Persia's vast deserts. Abdullah's prototypes for this robot are what the survey group found on their mission. And if you're still with me, hang on, we're, we're, we're not done yet. Abdullah is actually dead, and he has been for quite some time. It is revealed that Goji, yeah, remember Goji? Goji is actually another robot created by Professor Tenma. Right before the war, Professor Abdullah hired Tenma to create an ideal robot that could be whatever it wanted. However, the robot was too advanced to operate correctly and wouldn't wake up. Sadly, after Abdullah's death in the war, Professor Tenma would use the memory of his final moments to install emotional upheaval data in his lifeless robot to wake it up. Using Abdullah's memories caused the robot to believe that it was Abdullah and assume his identity. The robot had two distinct personalities, one that went by Professor Abdullah and another that went by Goji, who repurposed Bora to enact his revenge on the survey group. The newly awakened Adam, before confronting Pluto, meets with Brow 1589. Both Adam and Brow 1589 are super intelligences that broke past the standard limitations of robots and gained emotion, giving them the ability to understand the motivations of others, something Gazikt was not capable of with his memory being wiped. The assassination of Gazikt becomes clearly the work of an external party, and that party being the United States of Thracia, and more specifically, Dr. Roosevelt sentient supercomputer that has been driving the entire conflict from behind the scenes. Adam asks Brow 1589 for a favor, and with that, takes off to find Pluto. Initially, upon waking up, Adam planned to take revenge on Pluto, but after seeing Gazik's death, and his realization right before, he comes to the understanding he did, that hatred begets more hatred, and decides to give Pluto another chance. After that, Adam plans to sacrifice himself to stop Bora, that's when Pluto takes his place, and as an atonement for his crimes, Pluto sacrifices himself to stop Bora from initiating a planet-ending event. And with that, Bora and Pluto were no more. But that still leaves the United States of Thracia, and Dr. Roosevelt. And at that moment is when we see the favor Adam asked of Brow 1589, as he infiltrates the headquarters of the United States of Thracia and destroys Dr. Roosevelt. Roosevelt was hoping for Bora to cause a world-ending event as well, in the hopes that robots could take over after. But it's likely Adam offered Brow 1589 his freedom for this favor. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a quick summary of the plot for Pluto. Of course, with a summary this size, guys, there is so much that I could not squeeze in. There always is. But I could not recommend this show enough. Please go watch it. But now, let's get into the review. As I said, we only slightly touched the surface of an incredibly complex and well-developed plot in Pluto, and I couldn't implore you to experience it yourself enough. The anime takes the brilliant story of the greatest robot on Earth and develops it into a beautiful masterpiece of its own. I mean, it's truly breathtaking. And on top of that, I think telling the story in the form of a murder mystery noir was the perfect choice, not just aesthetically, but thematically as well. Absolutely brilliant. First off, from a world-building perspective, Pluto goes above and beyond really building a believable society where robots and humans coexist. Humans' hatred for robots is very apparent in this society, and the prejudice runs high. We see that robots do everything possible to assimilate with humans in this society, from cooking and eating, though robots do not require it, down to crying and betraying other human emotions. Earlier, we spoke about the 39th Central Asian War being, for lack of a better term, a central event in this story, and I'd say the world they live in certainly reflects that. And not just from a thematic standpoint, it visually looks grittier and darker. Life for robots in this society is not without rights, as we see laws made for robots regularly, but acceptance and tolerance for robot kind is beyond low. The next thing I'd like to talk about is the themes, because thematically, Pluto is on another level, and its bandlets of truly beautiful and well thought out themes may be its best quality. And that's saying something, because Pluto does a plethora of things exceptionally well. 
We spoke a little bit about the central theme of what hate can do to the soul, specifically about how nothing is ever born of it. Pluto, however, takes a much deeper look at what makes humans, well, human. We see how the robots, through experiencing complex emotions, specifically empathy, become sentient. There was a brilliant scene with Gazikt as he witnesses two grieving families deal with the loss of a child. Though one family was human and the other was robot, robots do understand complex emotions. And now that I'm saying that out loud, we honestly didn't speak about Euron enough. Because that was like her entire character's purpose, to bridge the emotional gap between humans and robots. Furthermore, Gazikt breaking past his program limitations when confronted with his son's killer is more human than robot if you ask me. I could say the same about Brando only thinking about his wife and kids in his dying moments. Or even Hercules questioning if he's developed as a person with a life that's been filled with nothing but violence. I could not praise Pluto enough on a thematic level. It was absolutely brilliant. Next up on the list, my favorite, let's talk about the character writing. And boy, was it phenomenal. Pluto took the basic character profiles from The Greatest Robot on Earth story and expanded them to a place I wouldn't have thought imaginable. We spoke briefly about the relationship between North Number 2 and Sir Duncan. North Number 2, a robot traumatized from his participation in the 39th Central Asian War, and Sir Duncan, a man traumatized by his perceived abandonment as a child. Initially, Sir Duncan wants nothing to do with North Number 2 or technology for that matter, even going as far to refuse prosthetic eyes and stay blind because he didn't want artificial intelligence telling him what was real. In the end, the two bond over music and it's truly beautiful. Or how about the layers of Abdullah's character, who truly wasn't an evil man. I mean, Abdullah was a victim who lost his family and wanted to do everything possible to get revenge for their deaths. Or how about the relationship between Professor Tenma and Adam? The man who created him can't accept him because he'll never be able to replace the memory of his son Tovio. I could go on and on about this absolute masterclass on character writing. Like I said before, the 1980s adaptation focuses on the internal conflict within Astro Boy. Pluto focuses on the internal conflict within all of the great robots and everybody else who participated in the 39th Central Asian War. Last but not least, let's talk about the animation. And right off the bat, I can tell you that Pluto is a very good looking anime. Studio M2 had the honors of animating this masterpiece, and I think they did an excellent job. Call me crazy, but the style almost reminded me of like a vintage 90s anime style, which you all know I'm very fond of. Also, for a story that's very slow paced, visually there's never a dull moment, and you'll be invested all the way through. So I could not implore you more to go experience this wonderful murder mystery ride. Well, needless to say, I enjoyed Pluto very, very much, and I highly recommend it to anyone watching. Almost makes me wonder if there's any other mangas based on classic manga arcs that will be absolutely mind-blowing. <clears throat> Guys, this is your cue to get in the comments to suggest my next review video. <clears throat> Pluto is a beautiful take on one of manga's most classic stories on one of manga's most classic heroes. If you stayed here this long and you haven't watched already, do yourself a favor and go watch Pluto. Thank me later. Pluto gets a 9.5 out of 10. As always, guys, get in the comments and let me know what you thought about this show. I'd love to hear from you. And as always, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and I'll catch you in the next one. Peace.